welcome to this Med School Tutors webinar, Finishing Strong on the Beast, Step 1. My name is Dave Del Negro. I am a second year emergency medicine resident hanging out in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, originally from the greatest state, New Jersey, obviously. With me tonight, <laughs> oh, starting off strong <laughs> with me tonight is Ms. Leah Gober. Leah, introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Leah Gober. I'm in the great state of Georgia at Mercer University School of Medicine. Um, and I'm a fourth year, so coming up on the match, really exciting. And I'm oh. also just like year round, much warmer than Dave in general. Just <laughs> got sunshine, you know. Who needs sunshine? You're gonna have two feet of snow. Uh, <laughs> hard bargain to sell. Uh, so it's a little bit about who we are, because we're gonna jump right in. We've been here a long time. We love what we do. We love to help. And look, I could see the boss in here, um, you know, we're a little family, we love to tutor, we love to teach. We'll talk more about that at the end, but always just a little reminder, you know, we're here because we like what we do. And I, this is our spare time and we have fun doing it. So Leah, what are we kind of, what are we gonna cover tonight? So we're gonna talk a lot about making your plan for your final days and how to finish strong. We're also gonna to touch on what not to do because what not to do is almost just as important as what to do in your last two to three weeks. Um, you know, what to do sort of is already what you're doing and what not to do is, are, they're very specific things that we're gonna to talk to you guys about. So um, we're gonna talk about structuring those final weeks, how to assess how to structure them based on your, your performance on tests and the goals that you have set for yourself. Um, we're gonna talk about your test day experience because when it comes down to it, like that is a huge and pivotal part of scoring well and being comfortable. So starting off, making your plan. The, it's an old, old saying in like aeronautics and anesthesia, for those of you going to anesthesia. Flying the plane is like the easy part. Taking off and touching down is the hardest part. And that's not you know, totally different than what we're doing here. We've got to touch down in a way that you're peaking mentally and physically at the right time without overtraining or anything like that. So a lot of times you start off by finding the couple resources you intend to use. As we get to the end, you should sort of shrink down and pick a couple high yield things and then don't over resource yourself. Know where your weaknesses are. For me, I was always horrible at like GYN path. Still can't do it. Thankfully, I don't have to anymore. But uh, so like know what you're bad at, know what you, you know, where those areas of improvement are so that you can target them near the end. Uh, and then focus on that high yield content. If you're not good at lysosomal storage diseases, that's one question, two maybe. But like if you're not good at congestive heart failure, ooh, that's, that, that's, that requires a little bit more, uh, you know, review. So, you know, look for your weaknesses, figure out which ones are important, triage your time appropriately. And then plan your last assessment. What's gonna be your last test? What does it mean? Are you gonna do any action items based off of it? Um, so always do the math. All the time, they, I have students who, they come up to me or they'll tell me like they have these plans and they're like taking a practice test the day before the exam. And like, Ooh, that's, a, that's a technical foul. We're gonna, we're gonna slow down. Um, so a lot, you know, you want to do more, you know, more, you know, sometimes less is more in this case. So uh, be honest with yourself. How, how much do you have in the tank? Where are you? Where do you want to be? Do you think there's more time left? Have you built in time to be a human? You know, a lot of this the mistake that students make is they write their study plans as if they're going to be 100% efficient every day. I'm 100% efficient at nothing. So I always tell students write 70% efficiency plans because people have birthdays, people get sick. You might want to watch something on TV. So give yourself that flexibility so you're not stressed and fixing your plan all the time. Are you going to burn yourself out? Are you going to be trading quality studying for quantity studying? So like trying to do a thousand flashcards a day near the end, 
you're, you're doing more, but are you getting out of it? So, you know, put, you know, find your goals, write flexible uh, plan over it and make sure that you're bringing quality over quantity. And here's a little example right there. What don't we do, Leah? So we definitely don't want to, you know, start off in your last two weeks and say, I'm going to watch all of Boards and Beyond. Mm -hmm. Ambitious. I love, I love the ambition, but I think with what Dave was saying, like quality over quantity. If you look at a plan and you say, I can't do this, but I'm going to try and I'm going to use my weekends to catch up. You're going to be playing catch up for a really long time. You don't want to play catch up in these last two weeks because you don't want to feel like you're flailing. You want to be in control. If you look at a plan and you say, I can definitely do that, but I might have an hour left at the end of the day. Great. That's great. You can use that hour to watch TV, to watch the Super Bowl, or to do more questions, right? So having that extra 20% of time or, or account, accounting for that extra 20% is a really good idea. Um, this applies to Pathoma too. This applies to Sketchy too. Don't start to try to watch all of something in two weeks. Uh, I think we're all type A people. We love checking boxes. I would love to check all of those boxes for boards and beyond, but the truth is it's just gonna stress you out. You aren't gonna check them all and you may not get as much out of it as you're hoping. Don't start doing questions for the first time. So you should have already been doing questions all along, right? Like if we're coming into the last two weeks, you should have been doing questions for a few weeks by now. This is sort of more of a, a point of like what you should be doing earlier so if you do find yourself doing questions for the first time in the last two weeks, um, I, I really encourage you to reach out to your mentors, reach out to MST, um, and we can sort of advise you on what the right options for you are at that time. Don't put off review of subjects you don't like. Like Dave said, mm -hmm. OB-GYN pathology. It's not, 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 my, not my finest hour either. Mm -hmm. And the best part about subjects you don't like or subjects that you're not good at is your U world tells you that, right? So you don't have to, you know, sit there and say, what am I really bad at? Because sometimes what we feel like we're bad at, like I don't feel strong in nephritic and nephrotic syndrome, but turns out I perform pretty well. And you world will tell you where your weaknesses are. So don't put off studying that, you know, congestive heart failure. You really, really need to put the time in, especially in these last two weeks on those big topics. And then definitely don't attempt to reread first aid as many times as you can. Um, First aid is something that uh, I think is becoming, you know, more controversial as to like how much you need to use it during your dedicated period anyway. But I, I definitely don't think, you know, spending one minute on each page and scanning as fast as you can is something that's going to be really beneficial for you in the long run. Do you have anything to add, Dave? Anything I, I missed? Or... I'm a big okay. fan of that sizzling hot take about first aid. Yeah. As someone, as someone who personally didn't really use first aid a lot. I find that students, it's, it's, it, it has its use, it has its value, but it turns Absolutely. into a crutch a lot of times. Yes. Because you can't do it wrong. Reading is reading. Uh, and a lot of times students will, will add first aid when they should be doing questions or flashcards right. or something more active. So, I agree. And that leads us nicely into like, our primary resources, which UWorld is the king of kings, as we know, in terms of question banks, um, the anchor. Uh, and UWorld is not only a question bank, it's a full scale learning system. So make, make it the anchor or foundation of your study plan. And again, first aid, I like first aid for some things, I like first aid for secondary sort of studying. You do it. You do a U world question, and you don't get it after the answer explanation. Then I go to first aid. It's typically, what I do. Um, do you, what do you? How do you usually work? You know, the content review and the questions in. So, so I, I really, I agree with you. I like the using it as more of a review tool of your primary resource, which almost makes it a primary resource, right? Cause you're using it in such close conjunction. Um, so I really like, I ask students to download it on their computer so they can control F Samoma, like for Samoma bodies. And they come up with all these different places where Samoma is. And they're like, wow, I didn't know I would find Samoma in reproductive because it's an in an ovarian tumor, right? Like. That's something that I, I totally forgot about. So 
I think it is it is a secondary resource, but it's it can be used in a way that makes it primary. I like that. So. Sort of like an adjunct almost. One yeah. A, one B. I like it. So so layering resources in the final week. Um, so I mean, you have your big things. Again, you world, you world, you world. It's it's not much of a secret these days. You world is the big one. Um, hold on one sec. We have a little friend who's trying to sabotage the, <laughs> the uh, my keyboard. Um, so yeah, UWorld is the first place to start. Use your first aid to supplement your UWorld question taking. And then additional things as needed. A good study plan to me, anchored on questions, uses first aid to review those topics that are tough. And if they're still tough, you turn them into a flashcard that you do for several days until you've got it down. And if you're on a more extended study plan or like, you know, if you're taking a leave of absence, then you start to look at these other supplemental question banks and boss being probably the biggest one that you'll see students who have completed your world once or twice, they'll go to. Um, how do, you, how do you typically use these sort of, you know, Anki and Amboss and Kaplan and Rx? I mean, almost exactly as you described. I, I strongly believe in adding a second question bank at some mm -hmm. point during the learning process. I think UWorld is like this really beautiful, uh, perfect question bank where it gives you as many, just enough details to help you get the question right, but not enough to make it too easy. Um, and then there are less perfect question banks because there are le less perfect question writers and who's to say which question writer you get on the day of, right? So you really wanna test your ability to respond to a question. And you get that by sort of seeing a bunch of different types of questions. And I think you get that through Amboss and Kaplan. Um, I, I personally use Kaplan. It was very frustrating. I found the explanations subpar. And I think it made me a better test taker because it frustrated me. So I knew what it was like to be, you know, on the angry during, you know, a practice <laughs> test and saying like, gosh, I wish I had one more piece of information. Um, but that's what it's going to be like day of, right? So mm -hmm. I, I, I do, I think adding in that second question bank is a great idea. No, I, I agree entirely. Um, it, depending on the length of the study plan, yeah. a lot of times yeah. I'll recommend different things. Usually... I, so I personally, I used Kaplan uh, before UWorld, actually. I used it for during my second year. Now, obviously, if you're, if you're like a first year, just, you know, here, just, you know, scoping out what it's going to be, you know, that might be sort of helpful advice to you because you don't want to use UWorld before you're dedicated. But a lot of times I'll tell students, if you've done UWorld already, Kaplan may be a little bit stepped down. Amboss is probably a little bit tougher. Um, yeah. But they, they both have their their uh, ups and downs and rx is always always fun i i did a rx in the beginning i loved the, the fact that the the relevant u world is at the bottom excuse me the relevant first aid is at the bottom that's the big uh the nice part about it all right three pass approach so you want so everything in life you see it again you see it again it's sort of, if you've ever seen a forgetting curve, and I'm sure many of you have, if you see something once, you remember 50% of it. You see it twice, that goes up to 70. You see it three times, it goes up to 80 and so on. So usually your first pass, it's a little bit slower. It's a little bit smoother. I typically tell students untimed system approach, tutor mode, you know, sop up like a sponge, all the things. Then your second pass or your third pass, you're speeding up now, you're working on timing, you're trying to move it into more uh, test-taking conditions. And a lot of times that second or third pass will tell you what's a real weakness versus, you know, I just didn't know that before. Because a lot of time that first pass is, you know, you're learning stuff that you didn't learn in class or maybe, you know, relatively new in terms of, uh, you know, the science. So if you see it during past two, past three, something come up again and again, that's usually your clue that it's a weakness to target later on. And I like this thing at the bottom here. Your question should increase over time. 
your sort of content review should decrease over time from more general to more targeted. By the end, you should be cranking out new world questions and doing you know, focal or specific weaknesses. So we've talked a lot about you world. Leah, what are some effective strategies, best practices to using you world? So the first thing I, I really want to stress to you guys tonight is that you world is a learning tool. It is not an assessment tool. So when you go and look at your friends, you world average, and you go and look at your, you know, your peers, you world average, and you get, you know, either excited about yours or, you know, you're a little bit concerned about how low yours is. Don't worry about it. It is 100% a learning tool. You are meant to learn through this. It's not the score that you get. It's how you use the information that they give you afterwards to apply it to the next set of questions. So for you world, you really wanna, you wanna do a full pass. I usually try to encourage students if they have time, do a second pass. And then once you're done, you really do wanna consider repeating and correct questions. If, if you don't have access to a second QBank or you're uncomfortable starting a second QBank at the point in which your uh, incorrect questions are the only thing that's available to you, then I think they're a great option. Um, I actually, so this has due questions in timed and mixed modes. Um, and I, I recommend that depending on the length of study. I think Dave, you referred to this earlier, but you can yeah. do tutor mode and still learn a lot. I think if you are two to three weeks out from your test, you should not be doing tutor mode. Mm -hmm. You should be doing timed mode and it should be completely mixed. If you're going through uh, UWorld for the first time, you can definitely do some tutor cardio questions and that sort of thing. Um, a lot of students want to take notes on their UWorld questions. And I don't discourage my students from doing that. If that's something that they really wanna do, I encourage them to do it. You just really wanna do it effectively. So. What I say to them is if you're going to take notes on the subject, I want you to write down or to pick two things maximum mm -hmm. to write down. I want you to get to one, one thing that you're gonna walk away with. Because the truth is, you know, you have paragraphs of information. Are you really gonna write all of that down and remember it? Or are you gonna write down one thing? Are you gonna say, what is the one thing I needed to get this question right? Or what is one thing I didn't know before I read this explanation? That's really what you're gonna walk away with. And if you're going to write notes, I need you to review them every day. Not every other day, not, not every third day. I really want you to review them every day. And that's why I really endorse the next, the next uh, bullet point, which is flashcards. You know, you have that one takeaway per question, you don't write it in a notebook, you actually put it into a flashcard. And if you're using something like Anki or there are other, you know, really great flashcard apps out there, they do the math for you. You know, you say, I am confident in this, non-confident in this, or I didn't know it at all. And they say, we're gonna show it to you again in one day, three days, or five days. And then you don't have to think about when you're gonna see it or how strong it is because they're already sort of doing that for you behind the scenes. Um, however, any student ever who's, who's wanted to use the World Notebook, I'm totally fine with it. Um, a lot of students use the, uh, what is that Microsoft? It's like the- OneNote? Yes, OneNote, yeah. And I, I think that's great, especially if you're doing something, if you're going through systems or if you're you know, in class, we do a lot of tutoring for curriculum and a lot of my curriculum students use that. And I think that's great. Um, or an Excel sheet's always, always a good idea too, because you can organize a little bit easier. Um, but I'm a, I'm a huge fan of the Anki note cards. What, what about you, Dave? Do you have an opinion on how to sort of yeah, you know, take, it's actually, take away? It's, it's not all that dissimilar to sort of the, the way you talk about it. Um, I also preach small notes. I actually, I usually take it a little bit further. I took a, a tool from my school's um, academic um, head who said one page front and back per day, that's it. If, like it. You're, if you are writing more than that, you are writing too much. So, I mean, you, you can find, you can get like small uh, print and all that stuff, but like <laughs> one page front and back, anything more than that, you're probably, it's, it's either a red flag that you need to go and review the foundational concept 
or mm -hmm. you're trying to memorize everything and you're, you're not distilling it down into that one or two sentence. Absolutely. Um, the other thing, the other thing I do, um, I usually, I'm a big fan of the, of the, the notebook. I'm big into like neurocognitive, whatever. And there's a lot of good science out there that says writing it gets you these sort of brain connections that like OneNote doesn't. Because when you type, you are basically a stenographer. You're copying and pasting. And the, the study talked about when you write something down, you can't write as fast as you type. So you're forced to rewrite it in the shorter version on the paper. And that actual math, or whatever you want to call it in your head, is where the sort of encoding and learning comes from. So like, that's my big thing is that I tell students is use the pen and paper because writing it down and you know, figuring out what to write is actually how your brain is going to learn. Absolutely. I think either either method is is taking something that could be very passive, right? You could mm -hmm. just passively read the explanation, but what you're doing is you're you're translating it. You're saying, I, I can only take away a subset of information. What am I choosing and where am I going to put it? So good deal. So some other Q banks. Um, we, we talked a little bit about these already. Uh, Dave and I both both love hate Kaplan, I would say. I don't yeah, know. <laughs> more, more love than hate for sure. Um, I love Amboss. I'm a huge Amboss fan. Um, MST knows this. The, the uh, home base knows how much I love Amboss. Um, I bought it a few years ago and I, I've, I've been using it since and I think it's a fantastic tool. I do think if you haven't used it prior to your dedicated starting, it is not a it is not a, an easy thing to, to master. So I would not recommend using it if you're if you haven't used it before, if you're gonna start, you know, using it right before dedicated, that's not something I would recommend. I use it mostly during third year, during clinical rotations, because it has a really great library. Um, I know a lot of schools pay for Rx for their students. And I think my initial recommendation for any student is if you get any of these QBanks for free, use that. Don't go buy a new one. All of these are going to give you the tools that you need, which is something just a little bit additional to UWorld, right? So I don't think if, if your school get, buys you Kaplan, don't go buy Rx and vice versa. Um, the advantages to using these QBanks is that you're seeing different questions. You're seeing different question styles. You're seeing different question writers asked different in different ways. So, you know, whereas your glomerulonephritis may be asked the same way every time on UWorld, which it's not, but like just for example, if it was, if they were constantly asking, you know, what is the immunofluorescent pattern we see in each of these, then there's a chance, a high chance that these other QBanks are going to ask something else. And that's, that's really valuable to be tested in a different way. You obviously have an increased volume of questions. So Dave alluded to this earlier that at the end, you really want to be like a question machine. And I know it's scary to see 120 questions a day and say, okay, I'm going to do that. I want you guys to know that you can do it and you should do it because that question curve is like, it's, it's a, what is it? It's like a parabola where mm -hmm. once you, it just, you increase exponentially with those extra 40 questions. Um, at least my students do. And I, I see a huge difference when they increase their volume of questions. The disadvantages to these QBanks is that they're just not as well researched, I would say. I agree with that statement. And the questions are 100% more obscure often. Um, and I think that's, like I said earlier, a plus and a minus. It can be a plus because your questions on step may be obscure. And it's good to know what that feels like. It's good to know how you react. And it's good to know what tools you have in your skill set and your toolbox um, to pull out when you're uncomfortable with a question or you're uncomfortable with you know, the information that you have to use to get it right. So anything else? Did I miss anything? No, I think that was really good. Uh, awesome. I think Amboss has sort of placed itself in the tier, like that second tier at this point, probably yeah, separated itself from Kaplan. So yeah. much so that my school said it was number one for step two, which, ooh, yeah, yeah, talk about, wow. talk about, talk about spicy takes. <laughs> <laughs> or progressive. Is it just really uh, progressive of them? I guess so. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think, I think, sort of, like I said, I'm a big fan of Amboss as well. Um, don't, so they measure their difficulty by hammers. 
kind of forget the five hammer questions. Yes. This was my recommendation. To, to some degree, sometimes if you're, if you're pressed for time, I say don't even do them. So like, what's, what's the yield of a question that 9% of people got right? If you see it on the real exam, nobody's going to get it right anyway. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, or luck. It's going to be a luck thing. Yeah, it's going to be a luck thing. You're not going to learn a lot out of it. Um, but those three and four hammer questions, those are the building blocks to a good score. Those are the challenging ones. What about so, flashcards? We talked a little bit about this already. So. Yeah, I'll give my take and then you'll give yours. How's that sound? Yeah. All right, awesome. And just just a note for all of you guys asking questions in the in the chat. We're going to answer those toward the end unless we find a way to integrate them in. But don't 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 leave. We will be answering them, okay? Um so my take on flashcards is that they're awesome. Dave? Yeah, concur. They're they're awesome. They're Not so a lot great. Of, a lot of disagreement there. <laughs> Big fan of Anki. I use it in residency. I can, I, so some students fall, you know, cause there's not as many quality decks. I encourage you to use it forever and ever and ever. So yeah. for I also, I think when you're, um, you know, when you're in step one, you're, if you use Anki to write your own questions, you know, to take that one liner away from a question and say, how, how do I get this question right next time? You know, I forgot that this was a symptom of, of, HIV. So here we go. I'm going to write a card on it. That's not something that stops at step one. It's something just like Dave said, you take it to step two, you take it to step three, you take it to residency. So the, you know, the space repetition is powerful. It, it has results. I have had two students so far in my two years at MST who said, I think I'm going to hold off. I'm not going to do it. And within three weeks, both of them were doing it. Mm -hmm. So it is something that I think people really respond to well. Uh, and it's so, you can make it so personalized, you guys. I mean, it is the most personalized study tool if you're writing questions about your own weaknesses. So powerful. Yeah. The only caveat is don't do it too much. Yes. I usually tell students if you're in dedicated, so th this number may vary between the both of us. I tell them try and keep a max of 200. Which oh, I say, an, I say no more than an hour. Which kind of works. Yeah. 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 I like that. Um, excellent. And then, of course, uncomfortable topics. Attack them hard. Uncomfortable topics are sort of a great place for group study, for tutor study as well. Yeah. If you're just not good at something and we all have those topics, find as many different ways to hear it. A boards and beyond video, a pathoma video, a professor, even a textbook, if, you, if it comes to that. So try and do the same material many different times. That's the way to break through uh, a wall. So if you ever, oh, oops, sorry, no, I was going to say, you mentioned lysosomal storage diseases hey. earlier. If you ever want like a really good cry and a good memorization tool, YouTube has some really tragic, like, you know, videos that sort of walk you through families. This is not something for dedicated, obviously, but Actually, it might be if you're looking for a good cry. I don't know. But YouTube, great, great resource too if you're really like not yeah. remembering. That's, that's stuff, a good so. point too. I feel like if, if, the, if the U world isn't cutting it, the first aid isn't cutting it, try a different medium. Yeah. Try that YouTube video. Uh, I, I, I was a big fan of Stomp on Step One, which was pretty, you know, like seven or eight minute videos for like biostats and all that. Um, try different mediums, try different things, break through that, that wall. Um, defining depth, ideal versus reality. We all go into med school thinking we're going to know everything about the life social storage diseases and all that stuff. When really you need to know like one, two things about each one of them for one, uh, for one, one question at most. So your 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 motivation your time your energy they're they are finite resources and you're almost thinking like a chess player um every time i meet a new student i actually give them this this article to read and it's worth it's worth mentioning it's an espn article on magnus carlson who's a who's the number one chess player in the world 
And it like talks about how he trains for chess tournaments where he sits down for eight hours. Sitting down for eight hours is kind of like step one. So, and you know, training is the same thing as test taking. So you need to come up with a, uh, a plan that focuses on your quality of training, quality of studying, knowing that your motivation is going to wax and wane, knowing that good days and bad days are coming, and that you're not going to know everything. You want to know a lot about the important stuff and be able to critically think about stuff that looks different, because that's the quintessential U World NBME uh, real exam thing is it's a it's a common thing and they've twisted it ever so slightly and you need to figure out how to turn it into that common thing again so you know that the ideal situation is that you would have all the time and the energy in the world you need to triage that time to find the things that um, that matter the things that you that you'll get the most yield out of and the most results and then cut down to a manageable amount of resources. You know, train correctly, don't overtrain, don't try and do seven days a week, 10 hours a day, stuff like that. Focus on that quality, not quantity. And as this, this very large red circle denotes, you, can't, you are not a robot. <laughs> So Elon Musk has not created the ultimate study machine yet. So any thoughts here? I agree. It's, it's really a hard reckoning. Like it's a personal mm -hmm. thing. You really have to say to yourself, like, can I do this? Um, and like you said, we all want to say, absolutely. Yes. I will learn everything. Here I go. Because we're used to that in undergrad too. Yeah. So. Yeah. And the truth wow. is it's not, it's not how it works in med school and it shouldn't be. Like there's an efficiency to this that once you get it and once you sort of like understand how to make yourself efficient, you're, you really are more quality focused. Tell us about practice tests and, and sort of how we use them, you know, in the days and weeks leading up to the real, the real thing. So I, um, practice tests are awesome. I, a lot of students ask me, which ones do I take when? And my belief, Dave, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, is that they're all equal. Is Ooh. it all, all of NBME, you know, Ooh. 16, 17, 18, uh. 19, it's really just a different, it's, it's a new testing format. We're trying to see what you know in this snapshot of time. And one may have more anatomy than another, one may have less. I think that there was a recent study that came out that said that UWorld 2 is by far the best predictor of score. So I always recommend to students, UWorld 2 should be your last one. So do it last and do it at least a week or more before your exam, because you want that extra time to A, fit in the free 120, which if you guys haven't heard of the free 120, it's um, the USMLE and BME releases 120 questions that are the most updated version of, you know, step one at that time. And I really encourage students to do the free 120. It's 120, so it's a set of three, like three blocks of 40, which is a lot of questions to do in a day. So um, I usually have students add that in, in between, you know, taking step two or uh, UWorld two and then doing their test. Um, and then from there, I say, whichever NBME. So um, Dave, I, from, from your response, it sounds like that might be controversial. I do know that the earlier ones have less data behind them and aren't as well, you know, researched yeah. and defined, but go ahead. Yeah, so we actually diverge a little bit here, which is not bad for anyone- No, it's good. All I'm saying, it's, it's, it's good. It's, it's, it's probably good that we have different ideas about it because there is no magic bullet. Right. Uh, so typically what I do is I take the big four, I like to call them, 18, 24, and the two-year-old assessments, and I save them for last. Those four have the best data around them, and it really in any order. Typically, I do NBME, U-World, NBME, B-World, because the U-Worlds have more to review. I try not to stack them back to back. 
Yeah. Those four, so typically when I write a schedule for a student, I write their practice test backwards. Those four go last. And after that point, I, I, I'm the same with you, <laughs> 16, 18, yeah. 16, 19. Usually I'll have them go in chronological order, all things keeping, you know, being equal because the way that the, so like this, this, this matters a little bit less now because they've retired some of the older ones. Um, but they, they're still floating around for like people who have PDF copies of like 13, 14, 15. They're good. I recommend them. They're, they're test taking. Um, I usually put those first because they're less representative of uh, the way that they changed the test in 2016, which I was one of the guinea pigs when they first did that. Um, and then, so usually I go in chronological order from oldest to newest. So it looks more like the real thing. And then I save those magic four for last. And usually the last one is around like five or six days out from the real thing. And then you have 120 as well. And I agree with what you said there. And then I usually take those magic four and I average those scores. And like, and then I can say, you're probably your bell curve is the average of those four, which is, which I, is also why I sort of cluster them. Yeah. I like it. I like it. That's much more, I'm, I'm sort of like, what do you want to do? Because, and I, I'll support the student absolutely and help, but um, I, I think there are, you know, it's, it's up to them as to what tests they want to yeah. take that day. Yeah. Um, in contrast to your U world, this is formative feedback. It's not a learning tool. It is an assessment tool. And it's telling you where do I lie in this, in this space and time with this test. You may get more neuro on one of these practice exams and you may say, well, on the real thing, I'll probably have equivalent neuro. That's not necessarily true. My test was incredibly heavy neuro. I know students who have incredibly heavy GI tests, heavy microbio tests. You, know, you don't know what you're gonna get, which is why I sort of am with the idea that the tests are equivalent and that you could take any one mm -hmm. and it could be equivalent to taking your test day of, which could be any one of those. Um, I do think utilizing all of them at your disposal is a good idea. Don't do more than one a week is my recommendation, just because you don't want to have too much to review unless we're working with a very short time frame and a student who is very motivated and is ready to like crush some practice tests. Um, you aren't using them to learn though, right? So every day that you do a practice test is one day that you're taking out learning, like really you world learning. You are gonna learn from the questions that you get wrong, obviously. Um, and then you do wanna use tests to simulate your test day experience. I, I am also curious about your take on this, Dave. I don't tell students to add on you world um, blocks to an MBME to simulate a full test. And my, my thought process is, you don't run a marathon to train for a marathon. You, you run like, okay, yeah. awesome. Good, I'm glad we're on the same page. You run like 18 miles to then run 26 on the day of, right? Yeah. And about four blocks out of seven, that is equivalent. Is like if you do you know, some, some math, it might be about 18 miles. So I don't think you know, adding on extra blocks to simulate the real thing is worth it because you're gonna have so much adrenaline that's gonna help you out and also, that sounds miserable. And this is already, <laughs> this is already a miserable time. Yeah. And it, and it, I don't think it really matters if you like add them on to the real, like you said, the real thing is just, it's different when you're stuck in that little cubicle. So. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think four gets you there. Four gets you to that feeling of, can I do this? Can I sit through this? When do I need to take breaks? When do I get thirsty? That sort of thing. So. Um, and then at the bottom, don't cram practice tests. I usually, so I, I, my general rule is wind down at the 72 hour mark. So like start ramping down your studying. So like no practice tests in the last three or four days. That's just my general rule. Like four day out, is like probably about as far as I would go. How do we interpret these bad boys. Do you want to do you want to take this one? Because you seemed like you had a really statistical way of looking at this, and I kind of want to hear it. Yeah. So, so like these. So there's 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 a bunch of different practice tests out there. I I, I kind of break them down into three categories. Your magic four, which I see a couple questions on there. It's the U World self assessments, NBME eighteen and NBME twenty four. 
Uh, there's good, there's good sort of studies for all of those. Again, I agree with you. You rolled two is probably the, the gold standard. Um, and the goal of the numbers that come out of them is to tell you approximately where you would be if you took the real thing within two weeks. Now, again, that's why I love taking those four and averaging them because I think it solves sort of the problem that, that, that you mentioned is that one test will be neuro heavy, one test will be guy heavy, and you have strength in an, a bigger N. Your N is four versus one in this case. Now again, there, it, history is littered with examples of, you know, it, it's just a prediction. Um, I, usually tell, I usually tell people, um, the, 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 this is a good rough estimate of where you could fall plus or minus eight. But at the same time, these, these assessments are open-ended. It's not like a CBSE, which is administered by the school and only available to schools and must be administered under actual test conditions. So there's always a little wiggle room. And like you can see, I mean, it's a, it's a bell curve, uh, but there's always little wiggle room as like, is every student taking this like the real thing? Are they, t are they not taking any unauthorized breaks? Is there, are they taking under real conditions? So expect a little bit of variability and that's the beauty in sort of clumping together the best ones to sort of give you a better figure out of it. Uh, a lot of times the NBMEs can have a little harsh curve. Our 18 and 18 is notorious for having a harsh curve. Um, and the U world ones can have a little bit softer curve. Now that, that seems to have sort of normalized over the year, over, over the last couple of years. But again, the power of averaging two NBMEs that are a bit harsh and the two U worlds that are a bit more generous. Um, any thoughts? I like it. Yeah. Awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, and obviously, if you know, this is more advice for those who are in the beginning and in the end, ask your school, do you guys plan on doing a CBSC? Yeah. CB CBSSA is the ones you buy, the self assessment, which is the SA. The CBSC is the ones that schools proctor. Ask them if they're willing to sponsor one. Because especially if you take one like, probably two thirds to three quarters of the way through your assessment, that gives you a standardized number under real test taking conditions. Cause I know our school gave us two of them, one in the very beginning and one near the end. And that sort of really helped a lot of us frame where we were. Um, ah, the age old question. Should I push my test back? Like most great things in life, the answer is depends, which is always unsatisfying. Um, but, I, but I like to use a couple extreme examples to illustrate. If your last two exams were 255 and 257, no, you probably shouldn't push it back. If your last two exams were 174 and 179, and you have two weeks to go, you should probably push it back. My general rule is you would love to have two scores in your goal zone, whatever that may be. For most people, a goal zone is 230, 240, 250. There's a few, so of note, there's really li very little utility in aiming for like 260 plus. Aiming for 270 just means you're gonna do a lot more than you need to do. You've got your 255 plus, you're fine, move on. Um, but like, you'd love to have a 242 and a 243. 240 is your sort of uh, goal zone. And then you've got to ask yourself, what's your risk tolerance? I'll give you a good example. One of, one of my friends in med school, awesome guy, one of the smartest in our class, just wanted to do family medicine in Tampa where I went to school, Champa Bay, topical. Um, and like, he was gonna get taken there no matter what. He went there for undergrad. His family was like connected with the city. They, he, he needed a P to get that MD. He was gonna get that residency slot there. 
So, like, he took step one during year two, which is kind of cool. So, like, because he had all this extra time to go get married and whatnot. Um, he had a lot more risk tolerance. He didn't need a 240, 245. But, like, if you have to go to Harvard for neurosurgery, you don't have a lot of risk tolerance in that case. If you need that 250 plus, and your last two practice tests are 236, 235, which are fine scores, but you have to go to Harvard for neurosurgery, your risk tolerance would say that you're not there yet. And again, using extreme examples to illustrate the point that most students fall in that gray zone, and that gray zone is kind of where we come in hand, in particular, I'd like to say. Leah, what are your thoughts? So I actually think MST is going to play a pretty a pretty cool mm -hmm. role here too because all of you guys watching y'all are it like yeah. you're the last class the last group of people where this test counts and I think this test going to pass fail is a pretty interesting move because a lot of people who come from smaller medical schools or places that aren't as well known this test is going to be the thing that sort of like either vaults you or doesn't. And I think that, you know, pushing it back and losing the ability to have a score on this, which a score could be really powerful when it comes to applying for residency. I think that's somewhere where MST can really come in and just like really optimize your schedule and really counsel you well. Um, I know I've been doing it a lot with my students. So I, I think, you know, what you mentioned about shooting for a 270, my, what I tell students is that anything above a 250 is luck. It's luck of, did you get test questions that you were good at that day? Did you get test questions that you felt comfortable? Was your seat hard? Were the noise canceling headphones like crushing your face at this point or were they just like mildly compressing it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So I think there is a, there's a luck component to this, but there's also like a unique opportunity here for you guys to have a score that really helps you move forward. Mm -hmm. um, so. That's my, no, I really that's, like my that. that's my speech. Um, and again, and again, so to me, it all comes to risk tolerance. Absolutely. And you mentioned some of the smaller schools, the less well-known schools. If you're an international yeah. medical graduate, again, your risk tolerance might not be the same. So, and again, I think that's, that's one of the things I think we do best as sort of a Absolutely. collection of peeps is helping you come to that. And it's not unlike, you know, talking to your patients and coming up with a decision for them. So. Absolutely. So quick note on cramming. So try not to cram. This is a, I like this. This is a, uh, this is a nice little pathway. What, uh, how should we ramp down and touch down? So I think you should never, what this pathway sort of touches on is don't, don't ever ramp down your questions, right? You want to keep, mm -hmm. you want to keep those up. So you see questions at less than, or uh, greater than 14 days out and questions at seven to 14 days. Um, First aid and some of your content accumulation also sorts, starts to sort of slow down when those last two weeks approach. There are crammable topics, right? I, I truly believe that statistics is a crammable topic. And I don't know if crammable is the right word or just like fresh face, like seeing it a few days before the test is a great idea. So I'm gonna talk about a few of the specific things that I do with students and Dave, please feel free to like add anything or, or tell them what you do with students. But some things I have students do in the last few days before their test is watch Pathoma one, two, and three again. Mm, I've heard that. There's a lot of basic material mm -hmm. in there and you've spent the last six weeks doing really like system-based, you're like digging deep into cardio, digging deep into respiratory, digging deep into like these really intricate things. And then Pathoma one, two, and three sort of bring you back and say, okay, but why is this stain of a glomerulus pink? Why is it eosinophilic? What charge is eosinophilic? And, and what does it tell us is in this cell, why is it staining pink? Or why is this mast cell staining blue? What is in the granules that cause it to stain blue? And I think those are really basic tools, really basic things that we were taught, you know, like first semester of first year, that we really do need to sort of refresh on. So I have students watch Pathoma one, two, and three. I have them split it up across three days um, and I don't have them ever slow down on questions. I also have them usually spend one day doing um, or a few days doing like 20 extra stats questions just to like see those stats again, 
do the equations again, maybe like get out a piece of paper and write all the equations you can remember for statistics and then go back to first aid and say, what did I forget? Um, so those are some of the things that, that I say are crammable topics. And those last one to two days, so please rest. And if you're like me, you might have to make a rest schedule. That is fine. <laughs> I, know, I know it sounds very type A, but if you have to say for two hours, I'm going to watch Netflix. And then for two hours, I'm going to you know, go buy groceries and cook this thing. If you have to make a schedule for how to rest, do it because those two days are gonna be like a little bit you know, stressful. You're about to take a huge test, but please, please take the time off. Like you've earned it. Your brain needs like glucose and it needs sleep and it needs to chill before it does like one of the hardest things it's ever done. So be kind to yourself, especially in those last two days. What do you think? Any, yeah. do you have anyone do anything specific like in those last few days? So uh, it's very similar, mostly rest. Um, I usually tell people if they're, you know, cause they're all the type A people. If you tell them to do nothing, they'll find something to do. Uh, oh, yeah. But I like the rest schedule. So I usually tell them like an hour or two at most of just reviewing memorizable, straight memorizable stuff. Review your autoantibodies, your HLA, your rate limiting enzyme, stuff that literally, like, like you said, fresh face stuff that you just want to have seen. And then I should try and tell them brain rest. And this is the thing I, I think never gets talked about enough. Eye rest or ocular rest. You're going to be staring at a computer screen for eight hours straining. So, um, and of course, we're all sort of hanging out inside with the pandemic going on. So, uh, I usually try and caution not too much Netflix, you know, try and get some sun. If you can go take a walk around the block, get some vitamin D, be happy. So, but yeah, lots of brain rest, nine hours of sleep each night, you know, make sure you're going to bed at the same night, the same time every night that last week. So you don't try and jolt yourself forward two or three hours and then add an hour on the night before because it's gonna take you forever to fall asleep. Um, but uh, yeah, so stuff like that. Cooking is great. I wish I had thought about cooking back then. I, that would have been awesome. I just played basketball in my backyard and just shot I wish I, I wish I could say I thought about it, but really it's more like do as I say, not as I did <laughs> type thing for sure. Ain't that, ain't that the truth? <laughs> but yeah, rest your brain. Rest your eyes. Don't don't yes. marathon stuff on Netflix all day for the next two days because you need your eyes to chill. So all right. Ah, so we're coming, we're coming to the end now. What to expect? All right. So your test day environment is going to be different based on your location. And I think that's something that is really hard for students to like, you know, visualize. So what you, what you do know is you can't control some things. You can control what to expect. You know you're going to do 280 questions. You know you're going to have an hour per block. You're going to have eight hours total during, during your daytime. And one hour of that is going to be uh, a break. So you have one hour of break time. If you skip your tutorial, you get an extra 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. You can do the tutorial ahead of time when you do the free 120. And it's the same tutorial. So if you want to, if you're worried about skipping that tutorial, then just do it the day before on the free 120 or do it when you do the free 120 and I'll tell you the same things. Um, that way on the day of, you can skip it. That, that way you have an hour and a 15 minutes of break time. You wanna make sure you're planning your breaks. So as you're taking those NBMEs throughout your dedicated period, you really wanna say like, oh, I can do two blocks feeling pretty okay. And then my third block, I start to freak out. Good, note that know that on test day, you should do those two blocks back to back, which is usually what I recommend for students anyway. But if someone's an especially nervous person or especially thirsty, um, then I say, go ahead and take a break. You have an hour and 15 minutes. Remember that when you're taking these breaks, depending on how busy your test center is, mm -hmm. there is time checking out and checking back in. And you have to account for it because you're using your break time. So if, if it takes you, if you see someone else get up, like two more people get up before you and they're going and hanging out about to check out, they have to do a whole checkout process. And then when you come back in, they do the same process they do when they check you in at the very beginning of the day. So you're emptying your pockets, you're pulling your, 
you know, your, um, your pants up for them to look at your ankles. All these things have to be done all over again. And sometimes that can add on like a substantial amount of time. I was a very efficient test taker and a very efficient break taker. And I used all of my break day off. So I think just knowing that you should plus or minus a few minutes on each end of the breaks that you're planning to take because of that check-in, check-out time. Um, and using those tests all along to simulate your test day experience, unfortunately, we don't get water. So if, you, you know, if you're taking an MBME and you find yourself guzzling water, maybe say, I should put my water bottle in the other room and try not to do that. Um, you are allowed a jacket. It has to be draped over the chair when you don't, when you aren't using it. Uh, and I, you're allowed, I think you're allowed gum or a mint, but you can't put it, you have to put it in before you enter, right? I think that's the... Uh, my, my center, they let me gum and they never really told me. Oh, I knew nice. gum was allowed. They never got yelled at it for. Okay. So, I mean, every, everyone's different. Center. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So another, another thing you can do, um, I'm not sure if you can do this in COVID times, but what we could do is we could call our local center and we could actually go to the center and do the free 120 at the center. That's really great because you get the drive, you get the nerves, right? You know where to go in, you know who to talk to, you know what the environment's going to look like. Is it going to be a really big room? Where are the bathrooms? Y'all, the bathrooms at my testing center, it's also a daycare and the toilet is like one of those like five-year-old toilets, you know, like the really tiny ones. It, it like threw me for a loop on test day. Don't let that be you, you know, know what the toilet looks like ahead of time and where it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, so those are just a few things, I think. Is there anything else that you would say about yeah. your test day environment? I, that's, that, that's really good. Um, sort of as little surprises as possible for testing. Yeah. I really like going to the center. The, the little things you just don't think about. I did everything from MCAT to step three at Clark, New Jersey, even when I lived in Tampa, because I knew they started at 9.30 a.m. I was all for, I was all for that. Florida started at seven. <laughs> and they had an in-house cafeteria so I could fire a $10 bill at the nice lady behind the counter so fast as I can and she would put some raviolis on my plate. <laughs> so the little things that, and you know, make you make sure you have all your snacks all figured out. Don't, yeah. don't hyper carbo load peanut butter, apples, you know, have your caffeine situation figured out. Try not to start new things during the actual test itself. Um, and just stuff like that. So, you know, get, you know, now we're coming sort of, you know, to the end now. We talked about a lot of this race. Right? So we can move through it with some speed, you know, try waking up every day so that you're not trying to reset your circadian rhythm the night of or the night before. Um, keep building that stamina, keep eating healthy, exercise, sleep, all that stuff. And then my favorite thing, your self-efficacy of the exam is like no correlation with how you actually get. It never does every time. Um, buy your, buy your cry snack beforehand, have it ready when you go home. Don't check the, a, don't check the score results the same day. It's not there. I promise you. So go ahead, move on with the rest of your life. It'll come there eventually. Every, everyone who's taken the test gets the results eventually. So not worth, not worth the stress I say. Um, so bring us home. All right. Y'all, y'all keep hanging in there with us. I, I swear the Q and A is so worth it. So just to recap what we sort of talked about, you really do want to optimize your, your testing environment, your, your testing experience and, and your, the weeks leading up to your test to get your best score. Review that unfamiliar content, review that uncomfortable content. If you don't know what it is, look at your U world, look at your last NBME and, and target it. You really want to prioritize questions over textbooks or lectures. Often we use textbooks and lectures as a crutch. Don't do that. You're cheating yourself. Use those questions. Active learning is really going to take you far for this exam. Triage those topics you struggle with. Once again, you know, use UWorld and NBME to help you sort of localize that. 
Um, I like, I like this. Ask what question you don't want to show up on test day. Like, do you want all the brain tumors to show up on test day? Are you a boss at brain tumors or are you like, Oh God, that would be terrible. Maybe you should review that. Um, and be realistic about what you can accomplish. If you are so, so on brain tumors, you may not want to spend time on that. Be realistic. Don't expect to get a perfect score. Anything above a 250, also maybe controversial is luck. I think. I think I think I can I can prepare a student for you know a 245, but I cannot prepare a student for a 265. I just I don't know what that that jump is. I don't know what makes someone a 245 versus a 265. I don't think there's a huge difference. Um, well, actually, there definitely isn't based on the bell curve. There's like what a few questions difference. Mm -hmm. um, but I think don't expect to get a perfect score. So be realistic and also be flexible with your goal. Your goal may change as you go on. You know, you may do your first practice exam and say, you know, I initially wanted to get a 250, but I think actually now I'd be pretty satisfied with a 230. And, you know, I want to go into this specialty and I feel comfortable with that score. Um, and then avoid cramming immediately before the exam. But, you know, I feel like they put this in here for me. Don't put off memorizing your biostats equations. Oh my God. I'm so embarrassing. I said oh. that earlier. <laughs> Personally. Don't, so don't, don't put it off. Don't put it off, but there is a way to like freshen it up. You know, you mm -hmm. can always feel, yeah. Good. Love it. Uh, yeah. Agree with pretty much every one of these. Uh, no, make sure you're going in with a realistic goal that matches, like you said, matches what you want to do in life. So, um, and then parting words and then we do our Q and A. All right, you guys, you, I mean, if you've made it this far, if you've made it to the point where you're taking step one, like that's huge. Give yeah. yourself credit for what you've done because it's amazing. And you're gonna get through this. We all did. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. It may be very dim. It may be hard to see. It may be neon. Like we don't, whatever it is, it's there and you will reach it. There is a point where you just sort of have to jump. You have to say, all right, I'm doing it. I'm making my schedule. I'm you know, getting in touch with MST or I'm taking my exam, like I'm doing it. And then stay positive. You know, there's a huge community out here of people. Reddit is amazing. Like there's so many great resources out there for you guys. Um, I encourage you to reach out to either us or any of those and and just know that that we believe in you and, um, and I know you guys believe in yourselves, so. Yeah, sometimes it's hard to remember that you guys are in a big bubble. And yeah. sometimes it's good to get out of that bubble. Talk to the rest of your family who would think that you've like parted the sea by, <laughs> by going to med school. You know, you know, you, you know, you forget that like by being in a med school, you're like one of the 1% smartest, yeah. youngest professionals in the world. So, and that could be hard when you're surrounded by nothing but other high achievers and you play the comparison game, your brain is playing all these tricks. Um, it's never true. So believe in yourself, you can do it. We believe in you, we've been there. It's unpleasant, but you can make it an okay experience. Um, all right, really quickly, a little bit about what we do. So we've talked about it briefly. Um, you know, we do tutoring for schedules for content for test taking for mbmes for foundation if it exists and has something to do with med school or test taking i'm sure we do it um and we do it pretty good here we get an average score increase of about 36 points uh, nice i'll take that um and our, our our you know we believe in what we do and what we you know what we bring to the table so we have a free phone consult to like see if it makes sense for you i encourage you if you're interested to to reach out and you know ask you know me you know i have this problem would this be a good fit for me you know sometimes it is um so um these are all the things we do and if you have any questions feel free to drop them in the box because it's q a time oprah style all right, well, what do we got here? Uh, I actually saw this one a couple times, so I'm gonna hit this one. Nicole O, oh, and I saw someone else upstairs, up, upstairs, up uh, upstream, said, "How much time is too much time reviewing your world questions?" 
real quick, I usually say if you get it right and you understand it and you know why it's right and, you know, your understanding matches the educational objective, 60 seconds. If you get it wrong and you're completely out to lunch, no idea what happened, three minutes. Um, if at the end of those three minutes, you're still out to lunch, review it again later on. So you try not to get stuck on one question for a half hour. Otherwise, it'll take you four or five, six hours to review a block. Um, that's my sort of go-to rule. How about you? Uh, I agree. I actually have a, I encourage students to set a three minute timer if they're having trouble with reviewing in, in a certain time period. So you can set a timer on your phone for three minutes and say, I'm going to give it all I got for this time. And that's it. Um, you can definitely rabbit hole pretty easily, right? You can, you can jump in and just go and go and go. So don't do it. You don't have time during dedicated, set your timer. When that horrible alarm clock goes off, you're on to the next question. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times I have, my students have like evening hours from like six to eight where it's just general review. And yeah. it's like all the things that you didn't get then, now you can go, you can walk gently into that rabbit hole. If CHF doesn't make any sense, now you watch a couple videos on it and you put it together. Not while you're in the middle of reviewing uh, a block. Um, quick one, thank you from Morteza A. Um, just to just to sort of fix what we said, um, not you know we didn't we didn't say don't review topics you don't like, you know be judicious and realistic about how important they are. If you don't like life, so we're just going to pick on life social storage diseases. Like if you're not great at them, get okay at them and be fine with that because it's going to be one question two max. You don't you don't have to be the expert in LSDs. Yes, LSDs, that's the right mnemonic. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so Garrett asked, what is your advice for reviewing MBME since they don't provide explanations? And this is a great question mm -hmm. because it's really tough since there aren't explanations out there. Um, I, I've, I said this earlier, but Reddit is a great resource. They mm -hmm. actually have like an updated version where they're trying to get people to write explanations for, you know, for free for some of these questions. Another... Um, so another resource is there, I think there's like a, a website somewhere that has some explanations. It may be scrambled now, but there are other versions of it that aren't scrambled. And then, I mean, I go over NBEs all the time with my students. So mm -hmm. be, especially because of this problem, students will do an NBME and say, I have, I screenshotted all the ones I have trouble with. I put it in the Google Drive. Can you look at them? And can we do like a session going over them? And I think that's something that they find really helpful and I, I find really rewarding because it reminds me of how confusing some of those questions can be and how back to the basics it requires you to go. Um, so I, I think for the NBMEs, just do your best um, and, and don't spend, I tell my students don't spend more than, like if you take an NBME in one day, review it that day, don't, don't let it cross over into the next day. Uh, we had a pair of ones earlier from Lane C and Me T. Uh, that YouTube biostats thing I mentioned was stomp on step one. But I, always, I don't know if you ever used them or heard of them. Yeah, pretty, pretty nice uh, five to 10 minute videos, especially for biostats, but I thought were particularly helpful. And they had a high yield indicator from like zero to 10. Yeah. Back in so the day. Trina asked, when should we take free 120 one week out? Um, I, I think for, for my students, I usually do like five days out is free 120 and they hit pathoma one, two, three, and then they have a day off and then they have the test. Um, and then a few days before that, they'll do U World two, depending on sort of what their schedule is and what their comfort level is, sometimes a week earlier. Sort of like what Dave said, I plan backwards. Yeah. So I say like, I'm gonna, here's test day. Four to five days earlier, I'm doing this. Four to five days before that, I'm doing this. And then every week before that, I'm taking a test. So I think free 120 is very comfortable to take one week out. I will say I've had students who said, I saw that test on the exam, or I saw that question on the exam, or a very similar question. For that reason, if I have an anxious student, or if I have a student that I just want to like sort of push a little bit more, who I think is comfortable, you know, reviewing the day before the test or doing a little, like an hour of work day, like the day before, um, I tell them just to review the free 120. Just like look over it again. Don't do it again, but look over it again. Because if there is a chance that you see a question that's repeated, it might be worth it, right? 
So see that all the time. That didn't happen for me, by the way. I did not see any repeats. I don't know if you did, Dave. I, I saw yeah, zero. Yeah. Okay, so it's, it's the, definitely worth it. I two banks too, so I just. Nice, sorry. <laughs> my plan was very simple. Question, <laughs> flashcard, sleep. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, one for a good one, um, again, from uh, Morteza A. What do you recommend to those who are stuck in chronic step one? pathway. I think chronic step one pathway sort of means in a rut. Um, you know, uh, you know, fix me if, if, if I interpreted that incorrectly. Um, when you're in a rut, that's usually when I recommend a second set of eyes to look over what you're doing um, because there may be something you're missing. Um, and, you know, this may be us, this may be school infrastructure. Um, find someone else to look at your plan and make sure that you're not going down an unusual rabbit hole. Uh, especially like if you've, you know, if you, if you're one of the students who've gotten extended time or you're taking a leave of absence, something like that, before you start a new plan, the second time around, have someone else look at what you've done, why you've done it a certain way and review. And that, that's one of the things I think we do particularly well. I agree. I like that. Um, so Nicole asked, do you recommend doing multiple smaller blocks of 10 until I reach 100 on 20? Or should I use the max 40 per block until I reach that? So Dave, I'm interested to hear your take on this too. Um, so I usually tell students, I want you doing at least 80 questions of 40 sets. So I want your first two sets of the day to be 40, period. Like I want you to get that repetition that sitting there that hour of test taking that two hours of review I want that for when you start to get up in the higher question you know when you're hitting like 120 110 I'm actually okay if you if you break it down to 20 I find it more manageable especially in like that last week when you're a little agitated you're a little bit like let's do this let's go like I'm ready and I, I think doing shorter blocks actually helps your attention span. I think this is a case by case basis. If you're a student who struggles with timing, you might not want to get out of that 40 question block setup. If you don't have trouble with timing and you're just trying to increase your in, um, I'm not opposed to 20 and 20 or 20 and 10 and 10. I think it just depends on the student, but I, I think that's a really great way to sort of, you know, keep your attention going and give you the, some students, like you get to the end of the day and you're like, I can't do another 40, but I could do another 10. Mm -hmm. And that's still a valuable 10. I still want you to do that. So um, yeah, I think there's there's some uh, value to that. What do you think, Dave? Yeah, when done correctly. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think we, we diverge ever so slightly. I usually, my I try and have a max questions per day of 100 actually, not 120. Okay. Now, is, is that 20 going to be like the, a huge difference? Probably not. Uh, I usually save a little more time in the evening for review. So like usually I'll tell them 40, 40, 20 with the thought process that you're looking forward to that shorter third block when you're a little more tired. Um, I actually, so I used to, I used to be anti 10, like, because uh, 10, it's just, I think you're chopping up a little bit too fine. Um, but I kind of like how you talk about, I can't do 40, but I could do 10 at the end of the day. And I think that's probably a good place to sort of do 10. Um, but, but, I, but, I, but yeah, I'm a big fan of the first two of the day being 40. Um, and then I usually intentionally drop to 20 as your brain starts to, to not drop higher. Yeah, <laughs> starts to tire. So trying to build intentional de-escalation throughout the day. But uh, usually I work in blocks of 40s or 40 or 20 otherwise. Excellent. All right, last call, y'all. Is there anything else we missed up in here? Ah, good one from Ladies G. Reviewing flashcards and what time in the day? That's a good one. I think that's the one we'll sort of, sort of end on here. Um, I usually, again, work from most active to most passive in the day, 
based off of you know circadian rhythm. Your your real exam is going to be in the morning, um, unfortunately, no matter what. Um, <laughs> I wish it was in the afternoon. Um, so I usually start off with the most mentally taxing activity, which is questions morning, afternoon, and again, most of my plans have students from 6 to 8 p.m. doing general review. And that general review includes their flashcards for the day. So I usually like flashcards in the evening because they're less intensive. Um, there's a cat trying to climb up. <laughs> I can't think. <laughs> um, you have such an active background so much <laughs> <laughs> um, so I like them in the evening because you're not critically thinking as much a good a good flashcard usually is mostly association um, it's putting together you know fomepazole and alcohol dehydrogenase not a ton of critical thinking there you want to be able to think of one when you think of the other so you can do that on a little bit more tired brain. So I, that's typically how I do or talk about flashcards. I, t I totally agree. I think that's absolutely the way to, to look at it. Um, and I, I think, you know, also if you're writing flashcards as you're going, then by the end of yeah. the day, if you're seeing it again, you're it's sort of like that yeah. space repetition that you're yeah. already employing. So um, I, I, I usually put mine in the evening too. It's also just like a much less intense, you're just like chilling, going through your flashcards, kind of eating dinner at the same time. It's relaxing. So, um, you guys were awesome. Thank you so much for all your questions, for all your involvement. If, if um, we didn't get to it, I know there's a couple in, unfortunately we're out of time. Feel free to send it to us or to the MST apparatus. It'll, it'll make its way into my inbox or your inbox somehow. Um, <laughs> but good luck, stay safe, stay well. Stay warm, stay warm. Stay warm. <laughs> uh, bye y'all, have a great night. Bye y'all.